congrats on the uh, huge event, getting this far. Now, I do want to talk about all the fights, but you did make a promise the other day that maybe you could give us some information about everybody that's been back here, everybody's been asking them, what do you make about the future of the promotion? Yeah. What's going on? Where's your home going to be next year? Can you give us anything at all? Yeah, as you guys know, I mean, listen, two weeks ago it was like, oh, this thing's going down in a week. A month ago it was, this thing's been going back and forth for how long? For the last six months. And so, to me, I don't want to really engage in any speculation or see where, uh, you know, where the future goes as far as, you know, is a deal going to happen? Is it not going to happen? You know, I, I mean, these things take time and until the time gets, you know, solidified, to me, it's just speculation, so I, I can't engage in that because it's really unfair, I think, to the promotion, the 300th event. We had some great fights tonight. We've been doing some great fights over the last, you know, let's say eight, nine years. And uh, this company has grown so much. I mean, it's such a, tonight's a celebration. So, you know, as far as like um, from two days ago till today, I honestly don't have an update. It's basically the same. So I'd be making something up just to, just to make you happy, but... Really, it's, it's, it's the same situation it was two days ago. So, you know, hopefully there'll be some clarity soon and, and we'll find out what's going on. I mean, I think you can understand why everybody wants to know. I think it's because, frankly, people are probably rooting for you guys to stick around. Yeah, I mean, listen. They, I think people feel like it's better with, with a few more people in the space. Yeah, but, you know, keep in mind, guys, I don't own Bellator. Bellator is not my company to own or to sell, to keep, to merge, to, you know. It, it's owned by Viacom, and, you know, they have a... A process that they do and they're they're doing what they need to do but uh it's not something that i own to sell or not sell right. so that's the truth you have the last one on this you have been through it before though so i guess i wonder when this talk started picking back up are you like oh man like i just did this like 12 years ago like i gotta go through and deal with this again because i'm sure that wasn't maybe the the most fun period of your life having to watch strike force go away and then just yep. kind of you know yep. and, and you know what I mean, the difference is i own strike force right this is something that i don't own so i it's hard for me to really comment on that because it's a completely different now it does there are some you know feelings that feel the same but uh, at the end of the day it's it's not my company hi scott i'm wondering if you could just talk about the top three three fights how uh, how did they go in your opinion did you feel like they went above and beyond like i i i, I I don't see how anybody can say that Chris Cyborg is not the GOAT in the female division. She is a beast. She's amazing, and she took care of business. To me, that was an amazing fight. Uzman fought a very tactical fight. Primus is no joke. This guy is a guy that has come out and upset a lot of our top guys. He wasn't even in this tournament. If you think about it, when we started in, what, in February, we announced it in February in L.A. We had all the guys come up. He wasn't even part of the tournament. But... Uh, because of uh, a failed test by one of the athletes that was in the tournament. He stepped in, and he's delivered. So, you know, he delivered another fight. I mean, Usman knows how dangerous Dread Primus is. I talked to Javier just in the back there a second ago, and he said, look, man, you know, it's, the kid's dangerous, and, and we had to respect him, and, and, and the fight was what it was. And outside of those three fights, was there anything on this card that kind of stands out to you, um, just a fighter, a, a particular fight, a moment, anything that kind of resonates with you? You know, there was, there was actually a lot of great fights, but I think the Liam McCourt fight really was something that I was really amazed at how much she dominated uh, Sarah. So it's, uh, it's something that I felt like, wow, this is, you know, she's ready to step up to the next level. She wants to fight Cyborg in the future. We'd lo would love to see it. Um, but, um, you know, she's going to have her hands full. I mean, that's, that's a tough test. I'd say congratulations on your win. Now, you know, go get in the gym and get back to work because it's not going to be any easy task to face Chris uh, at any time. And I just have one pertaining to the sale. Um, if something were to happen where Bellator would just cease to exist in any capacity, would there be a goodbye or would you guys just kind of fade off into the sunset? Do you, you plan something? Oh, you guys thought I was going to have some kind of speech today and make some kind of announcement? Well, here it is. There's no announcement. I'm just asking you guys. I mean, honestly, that's... Look, I have a contract with Viacom. I'm going to honor my contract with Viacom and or Paramount actually now. So, you know, to me, there's a lot of uncertainty and a, a lot of unknowns right now. But hopefully we'll have some clarity soon and everybody can figure it out. Right here. So with this being Bellator's 300th event, mm -hmm. what would you say would be your favorite event so far? Oh, man, that's a tough one. 
That is a that's a tough, tough, tough task. I mean, there's been so many great fights in this company, and um, you know, to what I, I would say, you know, in the early part of this company, we had a lot of you know stars that uh, you know maybe have you know been around for a while, and and to me, what I'm really proud of is we identified four, five, six athletes that we said these are going to be the future of our company, and it was Usman, AJ McKee. Um, it was, um, God, I was just forgetting something, but you know, we have Cyborg, we started building a roster that was amazing. And so, when you think about how deep this roster is, Aaron Pico is another guy that comes to my mind, and, and, and the list goes on and on and on. We're not, you know, we, we were a company that went out and said, We're gonna put our back on five different people, and then you know, we had to have dance partners for all these fighters, and we had to bring in, you know, the best fighters to fight these guys. and and these tournaments really have been special, you know. And when I think about the, uh, the amazing work that we've done, and, and it all started back in 2014. I sat down with Bob Cook, who, uh, if you guys, some of you guys probably know Bob Cook's history, but unbelievable talent scout. Him and Javier helped me in the very beginning of Strike Force. And when, when, I, when I came on board Bellator, and I started working for Kevin Kay at Spike TV, and we said, okay, we're gonna build this company. I sat there, and, and we went through the roster, and me and Bob went through the roster, and I said, what do you think, Bob? And he said, hmm, I don't, I don't think you have very much here right now. So you're going to have to start signing guys and get busy and get to work, and we got a long way to go. And so to finally see it come to fruition, what Bob and I sat down and you know, started mapping out, Mike Kogan was very instrumental in bringing some of the top guys here and managing the talent. And uh, so you know, it's, it's, been, it's been a great, great experience to watch this company grow. Think about it. You know, when, when you think about what are the company right now besides the UFC is going to arenas and basically selling what they what we do here or we sold out in Paris we sold out in Ireland a couple of times we sold out in Chicago I mean it's you know it's good to see the brand grow to the point it was because when I first came here it was you know we were doing little casino shows and and I sat there the very first fight excuse me very first fight and I said Oh man, this, this, we got we got a long way to go. This is this is this is going to be a lot of work, and you know it just proves. Listen, I worked hard in this company. I got an amazing staff. They all worked hard. We all found a common goal in where we wanted to go with the brand, and I think we executed. So if you think about you know how far it's come, that's really what I'm really proud of. And I'm proud of the athletes that we have here and who we have developed. And you know, listen, Strike Force was amazing. You know, I think that. The UFC benefited from Strike Force's roster that came over there and stayed, but you know we we took you know fighters that had no fights in Strike Force and we built them, built their careers, and same thing over here, and we're doing it right now. So, you know I think the sky's the limit, and I think we have a lot of talent on this roster, and you know we'll see what the future falls, unfolds. One more for me. Mm -hmm. So coming over from Strike Force, what would you say was the biggest lesson that you learned from Strike Force to help you succeed in Bellator? You know, I'll tell you, um, that's a very good question because, you know, this is something where I look back in my career as, you know, having, having different seasons. Like, life has different seasons, right? And I feel like in seven, eight, nine, ten year increments, I had the one year, because, you know, this is, this is my 37th, 38th year in the martial art fight business. And it started with professional kickboxing. And then it went from that, and that was the that was the era where they actually I promoted fights this long ago where you had guys that had to wear long pants, you had to throw eight kicks per round, they were counting the cards, it was on ESPN. I don't know if you guys watch it, but you know that's that well, that was the era that I started my promotion, you know, business. And Javier Mendez fought for me, Mike Winklejohn fought for me, Rick Rufus fought for me, and then you know then then came the the second generation where we had Alice Gong and Kung Lee and Jean-Claude Lallier and all the Fairtex killers. And then came, you know, let's say the K-1 era. And that was another chapter, another season, I think, in my career. And then from K-1, it went to Strike Force MMA. And then it went to, and then, you know, I sold the company and then I was in a non-compete, so uh, I couldn't go anywhere. And then, I, and then now the Bellator era came. And so, you know, when you think about all the great fights in the history, it's it's really it's really hard to identify like one fight or, but I can tell you this: the greatest fight that I've ever seen, I think, in person, there's two fights that come to my mind, and the one is 
in Pride, Las Vegas. I think it was Pride 1 or 2. It was um, Gomi fighting Nate, Nick Diaz. That, I thought that was unbelievable. And then the second I thought was Paul Daly fighting Nick Diaz here uh, back in 2014, 2013, something like that. But, yeah, I think, I think those are my two favorites. <coughs> What's up, Scott? Congrats on another big event. This was monumental. It was huge. San Diego enjoyed it. Um, you know, you always give a lot of credit. Chael said this earlier this week. You give a lot of credit to the fighters, the people around you. I truly believe that you deserve a round of applause. You know, you deserve some credit. Thank you. It's obviously your way. It's the person you are. There's nothing wrong with it, obviously. But how come you give all these other people credit and you don't take as much? You know what? To me, I've always felt this way is that our, my job is to promote the athletes. My job is to promote the event. My job is to promote the fight. To me, this is about the fighters. The league is important, yes, and, and you have to promote the league. But, man, at the end of the day, and I learned this from Mr. Ishii in K1 when I was working for Japan in Japan, and he said, never forget that these athletes are the ones stepping into the ring and putting their life on the line. It's not you. You're the facilitator, but, and you could be the promoter, but really, it's these guys. And, and, and it really, it's always stuck with me because at the end of the day, they have the samurai spirit. They have the Bushido spirit, right? And so I love martial arts. It's been part of my life for a long time. And, and I've had a great martial arts journey. And part of it is to be able to watch these guys just develop and grow and grow. And, and, and really, it's, you know, I, I have so much respect for these fighters because what they do, think about it. They walk into a cage. They lock the door. There's one referee in there, and then it's on. That, that's a very unique you know, mindset, the mental mindset of a warrior, right? To me, that's what that is. And so I have so much respect for these guys, so much love for these guys and girls. It's like, you know, that's it's something very special. And that, to me, that's the martial arts way. And so that's how I was brought up. I like that a lot, man. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you so this week earlier, we saw Leighton Vassell. Unfortunately, he was ill and had to pull, pull out of this fight. Is Two questions. I'll make it into one. Is replacements in these title fights something that is like a little bit more important to you now? And also, is that Bader Vassell fight something that we could see in Chicago at 301 later yeah, this year? I, I mean, I don't think 301 is already full, so I don't think that's going to be possible. But I will say this: when when I think about you know replacements, right? We heard from Linton Vassell's management he was sick, right? And basically, you have seven days to find a new replacement. And yeah, the phone rang, but you know, are they in tip top shape to fight a guy like Ryan Bader? How many people can do that to begin with, right? And then not have a full training camp, train for, so you know, to me, it wasn't, it wasn't worth it. To me, I wanna, when we promote Ryan, he's gotta be in a really good fight, a good matchup, has to be fair training. And, and, and this has been, a, not just for this fight, this has been an ongoing discussion I've had with my team, was like, look, we're not gonna just put in anybody to fight anybody. You know, if you have a, you're saying this is a world title fight in the heavyweight division, and you're saying this is one of the best fight fighters, heavyweight fighters in the world, he's got to fight somebody else that's just as tough. And they have to have the ability to train and perform. Otherwise, you know what you're going to end up with. You're just going to end up with, you know, a bad performance on one person's end. And so it's not fair. I don't think it's fair for the audience. And I, I just don't think it makes sense. This is something that we've adopted, you know, years ago, not just in the last, you know, two weeks or three weeks. Thank you. Scott, uh, Leah came into the, the cage afterwards to kind of, you know, get something going with Chris. It's already October. You have a fight coming up in November. How far down the road are you really looking if, if you're going to make that fight? I mean, how long is the leash that you can, can really examine well, you making know, that fight? Uh, the world champions, you know, we try to fight them twice a year. So that's kind of what you know, I would put on the calendar. Like, you know, when Chris wants to fight again, she's probably going to want to go rest and take a vacation and go do whatever she does. But, you know, we'll be back in touch with them soon. But I'm, you know, that, that's a fight that, you know, Leah wants and Cyborg will, will definitely take it. So, you know, it's, you know, I always have that saying, I'm gonna go back to my camp and talk to my guys and shuffle the deck and, and see what we come up with next week. And then you briefly mentioned the non-compete that you had uh, after Strike Force before you came here. Is there some language in your contract that you have now that could keep you out of the promotion business uh, 
given whatever could happen, or is there, you know, will you be able to continue to promote fights regardless of what happens? Yeah, uh, well, I don't want to get into my contractual status with, with Viacom, but I will say this, you know, you can only do a non-compete when, you, when you're the owner, right? So I'm not the owner of a company, so, you know, but I'm not going to get into the details of, you know, when it expires or how it goes or, you know, any of those details, but, you know, when, uh, you know, especially when I live in California, it's, it's a much different, you know, work environment there, but, um, you know, it's a good question. And then, uh, you know, you own Strike Force. That was your child. So Bellator mm -hmm. maybe is a stepchild. I don't know <laughs> exactly. But, um, you know, what, what has the difference been between founding a promotion, starting it, and then joining something, you know, 100 events in and needing to, to change it up I and mean, do it your way? I mean, Strike Force, I don't even th I think we had probably, what, like 40, 50 events maybe in Strike Force? Maybe. Here, I think I promoted like 170, 180 events for this company. And you know what? I, this is just my work ethic. It's like I, I treat this like my own company, right? Take calls 24 hours a day on the phone all the time, trying to, you know, trying to, you know, maximize the growth of this company. And, and if you think about it, we went from a, uh, you know, let's say a domestic product on Spike TV to a global product. We have deals with the BBC. We have deals with Unext in Japan. We have deals in Ireland on Virgin. This, this is broadcast in 160 countries around the world. I mean, it's, you know, and the, including this fight here tonight. So it's, it's something that, you know, uh, the distribution, we're really proud of, of the distribution of this, uh, of this company. Scott right here. Uh, you previously, like in years past, had employed a strategy of kind of, or developed a reputation mm -hmm. of signing, you know, veteran UFC fighters and going that route to sort of go for the name value of guys that were leaving that promotion. But in recent years, you've really uh, focused on developing homegrown talent, and it's shown. And we're at a point now where we're actually having conversations about would this champion beat the UFC's champion? Would this Bellator champion beat the UFC's champion? So given that the promotion is where it's at, from a competitive standpoint in the cage, are you, are you disappointed that we're even having this conversation about Bellator going away or everything that's going on around the promotion right now? Well, I mean, listen, that's speculation again. So let's see, let's see what happens. It could still go a lot of different ways, honestly. So to me, I don't, I don't want to engage in any kind of conversation, any kind of gossip or any kind of speculations. Okay. And then the la other question I wanted to ask, um, uh, recently Dana White was asked about Bellator mm -hmm. situation, and he had said, why on God's bleep and earth would anybody buy Bellator? But then a week later, uh, he changed his tune and said it would be a good thing if Bellator stuck around. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you make of his comments? What's I mean, your reaction to that? You know, listen, it's, uh, it's it, you know, I, I, and I didn't even hear that, so I don't even know how to comment. But um, listen, we have, we have a great company. And when you talk about clear number two sp in the space, nobody has the fighters that we have. Nobody can pack this arena like we can pack, other than the UFC. So... When, uh, when I think about, you know, negative comments coming from other promoters, it just is what it is. It doesn't, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not really impacted by that. I really try to focus on business at hand and what, what's important to the growth of this company and the growth of our employees to, you know, to try to keep this going forward. So to me, I focus on what we're doing and, and not any outside disturbance. Hey, Scott, right go, here. Go Niners. What's up, Scott? Uh, I know the event just ended, but I gotta say, Grant Neal came out here tonight and looked like an absolute dog at middleweight, cutting down from light heavyweight to middleweight. He was a top-ranked contender at 205, now he's at 185. He called for a title shot with Johnny Eblen. Another guy calling for a title shot with Johnny Eblen is Aaron Jeffrey. What do you make of that whole situation at middleweight? It seems like there's two top contenders ready for a title shot. Yeah, you know what? Um, Johnny just fought, and so, you know, we're gonna go back to the drawing board with him. Of course, we'll take a look and see what happened, but. Um, you know what, we're not gonna jump to any decisions on who's gonna, who we'll fight next. Uh, but, you know, we are looking to continue to, to grow the, our division and, and these guys will definitely contribute to, to the growth of the 185 pound division. And That's then Ali. Ali's like, get Usman in here. He's hurry up, he needs to go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Last one for me, you're gonna love this question, Scott, I promise. Uh, I know you're not the owner, as you mentioned, it's not your decision to buy, sell, merge and whatnot. But when you heard the rumors, just like us media members and the fans out there, that there is a chance, there is some speculation surrounding a possible merge with PFL, was there a little sense of excitement you felt? Maybe something new, oh, that would be cool? Or is it more like you'd rather keep Bellator? If it were up to you, your opinion, 
keep Bellator a separate entity. Again, you know, that's something that let's just see what happens, you know, because, again, I'll, I'll, be, you know, I'll be answering on speculation. So, you know, I don't, I, don't uh, I, I really just like to keep my thoughts to myself. But there'll be a time where, you know, we can have a, a conversation if this thing happens or not. Thank you, guys.